Uh, for today, I'm going to be primarily talking about some of the differences that we've started to see, uh, some of the shifts we started to see in the industry. Uh, I'm going to be talking in general how machine learning sort of fits into that. And then I'll be talking a little bit about um, some of the things our clients are doing. Um, and then I'll be diving into questions. I'll probably spend about 20 to 30 minutes kind of giving some general background. <clears throat> I'll do 15 minutes on a bunch of pre-submitted questions and then we'll uh, have a little bit more time if people get some questions while I'm talking uh, to answer some questions from the audience right now. So just really, really quickly to start off with, uh, I am the CEO of Boosted AI and we have built uh, a core engine that's designed to make it easy for an investment manager to incorporate machine learning um, and alternative data into your process. Um, effectively, you come into the system, you tell the system what your goal is. Now it could just be, I wanna find alpha, um, or it could be something like I want to uh, reduce risk, minimize drawdowns, maximize sharp. It could be something like I wanna find stocks that are gonna beat, um, beat earnings or find stocks that are gonna do a share buyback or you know whatever it is, you come into the system, you tell the system what your goal is, you give the system the data, the system's going to spit back recommendations and really importantly, sort of give you a detailed explanation behind why. It's not gonna just say you should buy the stock or sell the stock, it's gonna say you should buy the stock because um, the uh, you know, news is beating up on it, um, analysts don't like it, but credit card data shows it's gonna have the best quarter ever. And so for us, it's not just about the sort of like machine learning, but it's about having the machine learning sort of communicate with a human in a way that makes it easy for uh, machines and, and people to work together. Um, and, you know, sort of in general, we started this company just over five years ago. And even back then, there was a huge amount of demand to start integrating and using some of this. Um, as many as 95% of investment managers believe that machine learning and data will be key differentiators over the next decade. Um, and, you know, we personally believe that by combining the domain-specific expertise of investment managers with the data and very advanced machine learning that we can bring to bear, uh, you can get a, a huge advantage versus more traditional ways of approaching it. I think what we've really noticed change though um, is just a massive spike of interest in this in 2022. Um, and I'd argue there's sort of a few things that are driving it. On the one hand, um, We've seen this explosion of data that's been happening for years. You know, if you go back to like the early 2000s, there was maybe a few dozen data sets that you cared about and maybe, you know, a dozen data providers you cared about. Today, there's hundreds of data providers and really thousands of data sets, right? And we can talk about everything from like geolocation data, satellite imagery data, credit card data, maritime data, um, things you wouldn't think about like truck ports um, or uh, the sort of general movement of goods or, or the you know, amount of distance to different planes you're traveling. There's this huge amount of additional data, a lot of which has got signal sort of embedded into it, um, but which could be very difficult to extract, even if you are you know, a traditional sophisticated quant firm, but uh, it can be even harder to extract really good signal from it if you come from a more fundamental background. Um, and I think the other thing that's really, really interesting is not just that you've seen this explosion of different data sets, but a lot of this explosion of data sets really started to happen in the 2010s. And what we've found is that generally speaking, you need at least 10 years of data before a data set uh, can be robust enough for an ML algorithm to drive a lot of value and get really good prediction from it. And so what's I think really, really interesting about right now is that a lot of these really kind of creative and interesting data sets that really started to come on the scene in the 2010s are just now getting to the point where they're maturing. So it's not just that you have this vast array of new data uh, that you could potentially get signal and um, value out of, but a lot of these data sets are ripening and maturing to the point where you can really take advantage of them uh, using advanced ML techniques. And I think in general too, we've seen kind of a huge shift in uh, interest um, towards uh, 
incorporating these into different parts of the process. There's, I think, a, a growing realization and understanding um, that machine learning can be very additive. It can help you approach stock picking, um, portfolio construction, risk analysis in ways that haven't really historically been done. Um, you know, in particular, especially going into um, the current year, we've seen a huge amount of interest on the uh, hedging side. We have a lot of clients that are coming in where they have, um, you know, a long portfolio of some kind, or maybe there's a particular stock that they're really excited about, and they want to use machine learning to basically find a basket of related stocks that they can use on the on the hedging side. I think kind of the other really key thing that we found is that it's not enough to just create um, machine learning that um, can give you strong signal, but you need to make sure that the machine can actually explain itself. It's not enough to just say buy or sell the stock. You need to have the machine actually tell you, this is why we think you should be buying the stock, or this is why we think you should be selling the stock. I think the other thing that's really, really interesting is over the past few years, really starting with the, the hit of COVID in 2020, we've had continuous regime shifts that have made it really, really hard for more traditional quant approaches to have success. Um, you know, if we think about, say, risk, um, as an example, the sort of traditional like axioma or bar risk factors uh, are going to be things like momentum, value, growth. And I would argue they did a very poor job of capturing a lot of the risk that hit in 2020. You know, if we think about like an old school sort of um, value vs uh, growth story, um, in 2001 and 2008, probably the right move was to get out of growth. Um, and go into value. If you did that in 2020, you were selling the Zooms and Doubles of the world, uh, and you were buying the SPGs and shopping malls of the world. Um, you know, another approach you might take um, is kind of like a PCA, a covariance-based approach, where you try to find correlated stocks. Well, again, you had a situation in 2020 where you know companies like SPG were correlated with fitness equipment, were correlated with like RCL, CCL were correlated with like uh, retirement homes, right? I don't think there's ever been a time in the entire history of the stock market where retirement homes and fitness equipment were correlated. So again, if you were using more of a standard sort of classical quant approach, you had a really hard time. I think what's really, really interesting about machine learning uh, is you can start to use unstructured data to sort of analyze some of these things. So you can start coming in and saying, you know, SPG is related to shopping malls. Shopping malls are related to social distancing. That relates to COVID. Um, and, you know, retirement homes related to an absolute demographic, that relates to COVID. And RCL and CCL related to Zika and other past pandemics, that relates to COVID. And, um, you know, fitness equipment related to social distancing, that's related to COVID. So all of a sudden you can start to create like a COVID risk basket or a vaccine risk basket or a reopening risk basket. Um, and by being able to sort of capture these other risks, um, it puts you in a more comfortable spot um, than just trying to capture the sort of historic things. And that's not to say that, you know, historical risk factors are not value add, uh, they can be, you know. Uh, we saw a recent uh, uh, factor rotation as, as recently as this month, um, where being able to mitigate against more classical uh, risk exposures is, is advantageous. But machine learning gives you capabilities and analysis that I think you really can't do with more historical and uh, classic approaches. And so where this has been really, really interesting for us as a firm is we've really started to see a bit of an inflection. Um, you know, historically, we were dealing with, uh, generally speaking, we were dealing at the portfolio manager level. Um, and generally speaking, you know, we were selling one or two seats into firms. Um, and, you know, our firms had a, a fairly wide variance in size, but the majority of our clients were kind of in the 1 billion to 10 billion range. Last year, I think one of the really interesting things is we saw a number of firms that started coming in buying dozens or as much as 100 seats at once. Um, and the size of the firms that were doing this started to get really, really big. You know, I think almost a third of our clients now, maybe maybe even a little bit higher than that, have over 100 billion in assets. And, you know, our, our biggest client managers are in the trillions. Um, and so one of the things we sort of observed as a firm is this has really gone from this theoretical kind of exciting thing um, that a lot of people saw as the future to something that is actively becoming the present. 
where a lot of firms are really adapting this in their process right now. Uh, and it, it really doesn't matter if you're a $10 million family office or a multi multi billion dollar long only shop, there seems to be a lot of different ways to incorporate this and sort of drive value out of it. Um, and sort of feeding into that, um, it's also not, a, not necessarily a simple process. Um, there's a lot of sort of idiosyncratic problems for making predictions um, into finance. You know, this is a, a famously noisy area. Um, one comment I like to talk about is, you know, if you're an asset manager and you're able to predict 55% of stocks that beat the benchmark, you're a rock star. Um, if we compare that to, you know, something like image recognition or speech or speaker recognition, um, those kinds of off the shelf ML algorithms can achieve accuracies in those domains of like 97%. So trying to take you know, the same kind of techniques you take for say speech recognition and adapting it to finance oftentimes really doesn't work because the noise in finance is so high. Um, there's also challenges related to the sort of non-stationarity of the data. You know, the meaning of the data is constantly shifting. Um, you know, having a, a trillion, a billion dollars in revenue in 1980 means something fundamentally different than having a billion dollars in revenue in, in 2022. Um, and so that's kind of the other thing is having a ready built platform that's already adapted to these finance specific problems, battle tested and worked on it, um, can be a heck of a lot easier than trying to completely build this in-house. Um, and, you know, I think sort of related to that, um, a lot of the big shifts that we've seen uh, in the market over the past few years have really spoken to some of the limitations uh, of some of the more classical approaches, and, and also some of the problems of not building really, really resilient uh, machine learning based approaches. You know, if you were following something that didn't do well in regime shifts, you've had a really bad time pretty much consistently over the past few years. First, you got hit by COVID uh, in March of 2020, then there would have been a no, a November, um, you know, reopening hit. Um, there's been a few factor rotations in the time since there's been the whole meme stock <laughs> uh, risk shift that came in. Um, you know, all kinds of weird surges that we've been seeing around vaccine news. So again, if you're using either more of a classical approach or if you're using something that's not tailor built and battle tested in the right way, um, you probably had and have continued to have a really, really hard time uh, building quantitative models in this space. And again, I think the thing that's really, really interesting and exciting about some of the work that we do uh, is we've built extremely adaptive machine learning. We've built systems that can adapt to the market. They can learn in non-standard ways, they can learn from non-standard data sets, um, and they learn in a much more adaptive way. Uh, and they're battle tested in a much more adaptive way um, than a lot more of these sort of classical approaches. And sort of in general, um, how the system works underneath the hood. Um, it's designed to be you know, glass box AI, interpretable AI, explainable AI, whatever, whatever verbiage you want to use. Um, we have sort of inside of our system, a few thousand different data sets um, that you can use right off the bat. Um, and you know, about 50% of our clients, that's kind of what they do. Uh, they're coming into the system. They're telling the system, this is the data I think is important. This is what my goal is. Um, the system spits back recommendations. And then it sort of explains itself because an explanation behind why. Uh, and then we find for about half of our clients, they're actually bringing in their own data, right? And this is where you can start to get some of the more unique data sets I was referencing, things like credit card data or market movie news or Twitter sentiment analysis or maritime data or geolocation data or you know, whatever it is that you're looking at. Um, and kind of on that front, the other sort of like really interesting thing is when the machine is, is giving back a prediction, sort of telling it in a way where it can tell you a little bit of a story. Um, and it's able to look at, you know, what we would call these sort of nonlinear interactions. Sort of like an sort of interesting example of this, you know, if I look at something like beta or volatility, the system is capable of figuring out that um, beta might be a very, very important signal, but it's not necessarily a positive or a negative signal. I need to look at something like beta and then maybe combine it with something like momentum, or maybe I need to take a look at beta and, and combine it with something like the amount of working capital um, to total assets you have, or maybe I need to take something like beta um, and combine it with uh, more macroeconomic data. Um, and similarly with volatility, you know, maybe I, maybe volatility can be a good or a bad thing, depending on the company, 
um, but I probably need other transformers. Um, and then, you know, some data sets might even have different meanings uh, across different sectors. Um, you know, having a high volatility for a technology company might mean something fundamentally different than having a high volatility in an energy company. Um, and sort of similarly, having um, a really high volatility for like an energy company means something different than having a high volatility uh, on a technology company. Uh, or, or kind of the other really interesting thing too is, is different types of factors might be more predictive uh, depending on the part of the space you're looking at. So if I think about something like PE ratio, that might be an excellent thing to look at for like industrials or material companies. Um, but when it comes to technology companies, maybe you really care about something like, you know, uh, price earnings growth or something like that. Um, and again, one of the really kind of interesting and cool things about our system underneath the hood um, is that it's able to analyze all these types of idiosyncratic relationships between the data, find them, and then actually report them back. You know, again, it's not just saying we like this company. It's also not just saying we like this company because of momentum. It's saying we like this company because the way that uh, the company's momentum is sort of interacting with the amount of cash flow and the analysts' uh, predictions suggest that the company should be a buy or suggest that the company should be a sell. And here's why. It thinks it should be a buyer or should be a sell. Uh, and so it sort of works by, you know, taking your expertise, taking your mandate, whatever it is, you know, if you want to be long, only long, short, um, if you want a 21 day or one year investment horizon, if you want a one day investment horizon, uh, if you want low turnover, high turnover, um, and then really making sure that it is picking back recommendations that really fit well into your workflow process. Um, and we found this can be really, really good on the, uh, you know, on the fundamental side, but it can also work really, really well for, for groups that um, have a, a quantitative side and a, um, and a fundamental side or a fundamental side. Uh, and the reason is that oftentimes we found that quant groups don't necessarily interact that well uh, with the fundamental groups. You know, if, you're, if you have a really, really predictive quantitative model and it agrees with a stock prediction that a PM wants to make, that's great. You know, maybe you're a little bit more confident, maybe you want to size up your bet a little bit, but if you're a fun fundamental PM and a quantitative model tells you to sell a position that you want to buy, it's really, really hard to operationalize that knowledge. Um, you know, your choices are basically um, reject your main process and become fundamental or ignore the signal. Uh, I think what's really, really interesting about a system like ours is it's not just saying, you know, you should sell this company. It's saying you should sell this company and here's why. Here's the data that we found into it. And it sort of gives a fundamental PM some strings to pull on. Oh, I didn't realize that credit card transactions were way down. Or, oh, I didn't realize that um, this external company uh, is maybe taking a look at buying this short in my, in my book. Or I didn't realize that, um, you know, there's this systematic risk that's starting to hit the stock that I'm not aware of. Um, and sort of by doing that, by able to actually tell a story, it does become ad additive to a fundamental process because you can sort of take a look at what the machine's learning. And, and sometimes you might disagree with the machine. You know, sometimes, you know, the machine might say something like um, Netflix is down and uh, it's, it's sort of dipped a little bit. And every time that it's dipped historically, um, that has been indicative of a buy. And you might be able to say, well, OK, you know, I can see that Netflix is, has dipped, but I know something the machine doesn't know. I know that Disney Plus is going to launch in a month. And that's probably what's occurring for the dip. And so, you know, I might actually disagree with the prediction the machines make. Um, and, and I think that part is really, really critical because machines are very, very good at analyzing a huge amount of data and finding different sets of repeatable signals. And oftentimes the machine, as a result of that, can find things that a human can miss. But there's an element of human intuition that a machine, in our opinion, really can't replicate. Uh, and so by being able to sort of have a help of a person build out a custom model, but then also build the model in a way where it interacts well with a person, you get a really solid combination between human's intuition um, and the machine's ability to really analyze a huge amount of data uh, and find consistent patterns from them. Um, and it's just sort of like illustrate a little bit around what that looks like, you know, in a more <clears throat> traditional uh, quantitative approach you might be able to like grab one of these quadrants um you know obviously in a fundamental approach you probably wouldn't be necessarily analyzing quite as many different positions uh, our system is able to sort of find these nuances it's able to find how different data sets are aligned to each other it's able to figure out that you know the sets of things that matter 
at a high PE and maybe different than the sets of things that matter at a low PE. The sets of things that matter for one sector might be different than the sets of things that work for a different sector. Uh, and so number one, we found that our system tends to be very uncorrelated to traditional techniques. You know, if we take our system and we approach it um, either to more traditional regression-based approaches, or even if you're trying to do, you know, more, I guess, modern sort of off-the-shelf machine learning approaches uh, with like a more, you know, modern, um, and end based regression or even tree based regression, uh, we find that we actually have very uncorrelated, uncorrelated results. And typically, our results are actually superior uh, to what you're seeing from a lot of the off the shelf techniques. And again, it's largely because we've done a really good job at modeling in the finite specific problems of, of uh, noise to signal and, and non stationarity. Um, the other thing, though, is you're, you're getting back these recommendations that um, are. Um, Extremely explainable, you know, something that usually is telling a story or a narrative that you can kind of understand. Um, we found that we're extremely robust to regime shifts uh, over the past few years. That has been, I think, very critical to anyone who's tried to deploy ML uh, into this space. Um, and sort of more or less underneath the hood, it's, it's basically doing a really good job of just finding a huge number of very subtle patterns. It's not, you know, oftentimes things that are leading to predictions are not the obvious things. It's not leaning on volatility or leaning on momentum. It's finding these idiosyncratic interactions between the underlying data series and then sort of reporting that back up to a human. Now, of course, you know, one of the cons is, um, as far as we know, our core technology is proprietary to our engine. And sort of beyond that, it tends to be very computationally expensive. Uh, so there's a whole process where you come in and build out a model. Um, and it can take a few iterations uh, before you get something that's that's really really firing and really successful. Um, and sort of you know on that front, the other thing I just want to really really briefly touch on uh, is actually on the risk mitigation and risk analysis side. So underneath the hood, we really break the problem into two parts. We think of one core problem as being related to basically stock prediction, you know, helping you find the the strong signal around the set of stocks you maybe want to buy or the set of stocks that you maybe want to um, maybe want to short. Um, and then the second problem is really related to portfolio construction. You know, once you've got a set of stocks that you want to buy or a set of stocks that you want to short, how do you figure out what the sizing should be? Do I want to maximize my sharp, minimize my probability of drawdown, just maximize alpha? Um, do I, or, or maybe I want to minimize my skew over time. Um, and then on the sort of risk side, you know, there can absolutely be value in some more classical quant factors, value, momentum, growth, uh, size, et cetera. Um, but I think the other thing that's really, really interesting is we're able to find a lot of these non-standard, non-traditional and sort of residual risk factors, right? And I sort of mentioned earlier how we can do things like analyze stuff like your COVID risk, your vaccine risk, your reopening risk, your meme stock risk, but it could be other things too, right? Uh, cloud computing, uh, you might find an AI risk cluster, um, and then, you know, sometimes the machine will actually find more classical like GIX2 level things. Uh, in this particular example, it found uh, airlines and oil and gas um, as potential risk factors. Um, so it's kind of cool. You know, you have the ability to do more of the like standard portfolio construction and, and risk analysis, but we also have a lot of these more residual things that we're able to analyze um, that can give you a very different perspective on some of the exposures you have in your portfolio you may not know uh, and give you really non-standard ways to um, mitigate risk. Okay, cool. So I'm now going to shift a little bit. Um, and maybe Sarab, I'll let you start asking some of the questions that were submitted um, ahead of time. Um, and then we'll open it up in the last 15 minutes or so for uh, some new audience questions. Thank you, Josh. Uh, let's dive in uh, into the wonderful questions we've received uh, from the uh, attending audience. Uh, number one, uh, I'm interested in understanding the role of AI in capital markets uh, and fundamental analysis. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, more or less, this touches on um, just about everything I, I talked about here. So kind of the use cases that we find most popular, um, you know, number one on the fundamental side, we have a lot of fundamental managers that are basically using it as a really advanced stock screener, um, or you kind of see it as like another tool or sort of analyst on your shoulder. You come into the system, um, you tell it, um, you know, again, here's what my objective is. I want to find companies that are going to have really good alpha, high return, beat earnings, whatever. Um, and then we'll sort of spit back. Okay, here's a hundred companies that you should maybe look at. Here's a hundred, you know, prospective shorts on the flip side. Here's the torpedoes you should be worried about. And then you can sort of use it for idea generation. 
um, use it to find different ways to incorporate it. Um, you know, we have some clients that literally every week uh, when they go into their investor committee meeting, uh, they're sort of bringing a printout of the top five or 10 different positions that came out of their model. Uh, and that's something incorporated in. Um, we have others that are, and the other thing is we have others that are actually using it soup to nuts. You know, about 25% of our users tend to be quant. Uh, and they're literally coming into the system. Um, they're really using it to either analyze different data sets, find what data sets have signal in it, or they're creating completely idiosyncratic uh, strategies. So they're coming to our system, they're using it to build out models at the front, do portfolio construction on it. Um, and then, you know, ultimately building non-standard strategies. Um, we actually have some uh, ETF or, or mutual fund managers that use it um, to build out product. So maybe you want to launch a new ETF um, related to some specific theme or some idea, um, and you just want to use our system to build that out. Um, we have, uh, and then, you know, kind of the other thing that's been really, really resonating well, uh, especially in the past month, um, has been around just sort of in general, the sort of risk side of things. Um, so we have another number of clients that are fundamentally oriented where they have long baskets. And, and what we found is a lot of fundamental managers tend to invest a lot of time and effort on the long side. Um, but maybe the, you know, the short side can be a little bit more tricky to find good shorts, or maybe that's not where your focus of your strategy is. Um, and that can be a, a really additive area uh, for the Boosted platform, because we can basically find companies that are similar to uh, the long book, um, have potentially some alpha in it on the short side, uh, and then construct a short basket that actually specifically mitigates against the risks from the long basket. Um, and so that's something we found that's been really, really valuable for a number of clients where you've got uh, a long book or a long strategy um, or, or even a particular stock that you really like, uh, maybe this new IPO or something like that you really want to hold on to. Um, and then we help you basically come up with a, a short basket on the flip side to hedge it out um, and uh, develop out uh, from the risk side. So those are some of the main ways that we've seen it. Um, but honestly, there's probably half a dozen other sort of use cases beyond that that uh, I'm not diving into. Thank you, thank you, Josh. That's uh, great. Uh, number two, uh, what are the critical AI skills that asset managers lack or fail to employ effectively to incorporate AI into their into their investment management process? Yeah, I actually think you don't necessarily need uh, very advanced machine learning skills itself. Um, you know, to be honest, a, a major portion of our client base um, really, you know, does not come from a highly technical background. Um, I think the biggest thing is there's still a little bit of, of, of sort of education that needs to happen in the industry just around exactly what you can do with technology like this. I think that's sort of the, the, the biggest disconnect we see is, you know, where, where can I get value? How can I incorporate uh, machine learning into my process? Where does it matter? Why does it matter? Um, and then, you know, also the limitations. What are things that I cannot do with machine learning? Um, you know, one thing I sort of emphasize is it's not the Terminator, it's not perfect. It's not gonna get a 100% hit rate on making predictions. Um, but what it can do is shift the odds in your favor. You know, we, we kind of help you become uh, an even better version of a casino where you can make more bets. Um, you know, we can tick up the accuracy a little bit. Uh, we can tick up your, your, you know, a few hundred basis points of alpha. Uh, or, or we can, you know, shift your, your error, your tracking error, your, you know, your, um, your drawdowns, you know, whatever. Um, so I think that would be a really the key thing is just understanding where and how can machine learning be valuable to my process, not necessarily the actual skill of ML itself. Of course, it helps, you know, you can absolutely go out and get educated and learn ML. Um, but I would argue that a lot of the problems for adapting machine learning into finance are very idiosyncratic to this domain. Uh, and so while some, you know, more classical machine learning knowledge is helpful, if you want to go that direction, you probably need to specialize a little bit more. Um, and so again, I find using a more battle-tested system to be somewhat helpful. Anyway, next, sorry, next question. Thank you, Josh. Uh, next one is a two-part question. Uh, I'll ask uh, one by one. Understanding the development of AI in asset management industry and the impact of, number one, existing team and company organization. Number two, impact uh, if an organization already has a rudimentary AI system built in-house but wants to scale it. Uh, that's the question. Cool. Yeah. So, um, you know, more or less, we found there's a little bit of a range um, in 
how clients think about things. So, you know, you have, you have some set of clients that are 100% fundamental. You have some clients that are somewhere on the range of, you know, somewhat fundamental. Maybe you're already using stock screening for your initial idea generation, or maybe uh, you have some mandate where you're only buying companies that match some specific ratio. Um, and then, of course, that goes all the way down to the sort of quant side. Um, and sort of depending on how the firm is already set up and the size of the firm and the types of strategies, um, there's a little bit of a difference. So on the fundamental side, you know, a lot of it is just about bringing in oftentimes very new capacities um, and, you know, a lot of the use cases that I've already talked about. Um, I think what's actually more interesting is your question around the, the quant side. So depending on if it's a fundamental firm that's investing in quant for the first time or a quant firm that's trying to scale up, I'm going to have two different answers. Um, our favorite, one of our favorite use cases, though, is a fundamental firm that's investing in quant for the first time. They have an existing quant team. And they're asking how to scale. Um, and, you know, as I sort of alluded to earlier, I think one of the really interesting things is that quant doesn't work that well out of the box in a fundamental process, because if all you have is a signal and that's the only thing the machine's telling you, it's really hard for a fundamental manager to actually incorporate that into your process. Now, we have seen some cases where, you know, there's quants that are doing more like KPI prediction. So maybe you have quants that are trying to make a prediction about like momentum or earnings or you know growth or something like that. Um, and that could potentially be a little bit valuable, you know, if, if the quants are able to do a really good job at predicting that earnings are going to go up. But again, if you don't understand why, if you don't understand what the machine learned, it can be a little bit hard for a fundamental user to incorporate it. So where we found that we can be really, really valuable is if you have a team that's already got um, you know, very strong fundamental process and they're investing for quant for the first time, we can sort of act as the bridge between both teams. Uh, number one, you know, we're happy to work with um, existing stacks. Um, but, you know, number two, if, if you go into our system and you're actually building out quantitative models in our system, it's already being done in a way where we can sort of interpret the model, understand the model and give detailed explanations about back. Uh, and so we kind of become a bridge where the quant users can develop models inside of our system and then spit back recommendations to the fundamental team in a way that they can really comfortably and easily incorporate into their process. Um, and I think the other thing too is, is, you know, if we go to the other direction of like firms that are already just only quant and they're trying to scale up, um, you know, we have a platform that either from a, a point and click standpoint um, or from uh, an API standpoint can really save you a huge amount of time and effort. You know, we do a whole bunch of stuff around data cleaning, analysis, integration. Uh, we do a lot of stuff around model building, um, you know, back testing, signal analysis, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so if you're just a sort of classical quant team and you're just trying to scale that up, um, I think there's a lot of stuff we can do to both expand the sort of mandate and what you're looking at, the set of stocks you're looking at, and also the number of data sets that you're analyzing. Thank you. Next question. Uh, how are hedge funds using machine learning to improve their risk management? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I touched on this a little bit in the presentation, um, but more or less, I think the really big thing is just find idiosyncratic risk, right? Um, you know, the sort of like two classical approaches I would I would, I would say are, are things like the axiom or bar thing, where you've got these like predefined factors like momentum, um, or the sort of like PCA slash LSA um, slash covariance based approach where you're trying to find correlations across stocks. And both of those approaches have really suffered over the past few years. Um, the really cool thing about machine learning is you can start to analyze semantic connections between stocks. You can start to analyze, um, you know, balance sheet connections across stocks. You can start to analyze all kinds of other really cool data sets that you might not get if all you're doing is basically doing computations on top of the price movement itself. Um, and so where we found there's a huge value out on the risk side is basically creating idiosyncratic risk, showing that idiosyncratic use of the user. You know, we're not just saying, here's a, a machine factor that you should mitigate against. The system will actually tell you, you know, this represents, um, this represents a COVID risk, or this represents vaccine risk, or this represents you know reopening risk, or um, you know maybe this represents uh, you know risk related to gaming taste, or you know whatever it is. The system can actually tell you, but actually being able to find these really non-standard risks that traditional systems don't—that's where we see the really value out there. Thank you. Do you have any out-of-sample track records to demonstrate that AI does indeed add alpha in real-world investment management applications? Yeah, so I mean, we've been operating as a company now for almost five years. Uh, we officially launched as a product in, uh, I think, May of 2019. Um, that was on the back of a few years of R&D. Um, you know, we're at the point now where there's billions that are actively affected uh, by our platform. 
Uh, we've got a number of clients that have been live trading money, you know, since 2019, all through several extremely hard for quant periods. Um, and so, yeah, this is, this is not theoretical. This is extremely battle tested, um, well functioning. Um, and I guess, you know, the other comment I'll make too is we just exited our series B, um, you know, last year. Um, and a lot of that was on the back of some pretty aggressive growth that we've seen from a whole bunch of different parts of the industry. Awesome. That's always hard thing to hear. Uh, next question. Where do you see the next trend in data and how is this obtainable? Yeah, so I think the really big thing on the data side, uh, which you're going to touch on a little bit in the presentation, is just that we have seen these, um, we're seeing more and more data sets come online. We're seeing more and more data sets that are really cool, really non-standard, um, where they've just been around long enough that um, you can um, actually start to get value and prediction out of it. I think the other thing too is we've gotten better at figuring out some of the core problems with data uh, and fixing it. So, you know, when I talk about that, like there's a lot of data sets out there that'll suffer from survivorship bias. And, and what I mean is they'll focus on like active tickers um, and, or, or, or they'll use a different method for collecting data for active tickers versus non-active tickers. And that could be even more dangerous uh, because if there's some kind of anomaly between active tickers and non-active tickers, the machine learning will pick up on it. It can be really, really smart, but it'll assume that that anomaly means something it doesn't. If, you know, the sort of trivial examples, if I only have a feature that appears only for actively companies, it'll assume, oh, having this feature means I don't go bankrupt. Uh, and so that'll look really, really great in a back test. But of course, in reality, nobody knows if the company's going to go bankrupt or not. You just messed up how you made your data in the first place. Uh, so that can become a really big key problem. Um, and so, you know, number one, we do a really good job in, in how we actually analyze and build out sort of point in time representation of, of our back test. But the other thing is we can actually detect some things like that. Uh, and by being able to detect uh, survivorship bias, you get better results out of it. Um, we've been able to find things like look-ahead bias. Uh, you know, look-ahead bias is this problem where, let's say, um, you know, it looks a trivial example like earnings. Let's say a company announces earnings on January 3rd, and then three weeks later, um, they, uh, they revise it. You want to make sure that you're using the actual data the market actually saw on Jan 3rd, not, um, not the sort of false data that the market wouldn't have seen for a few weeks. Um, and so kind of like the, the two major things are, you know, number one, there's just a lot more data sets that have been around long enough um, that you can actually start getting value out of it. And number two, um, the techniques and technology around cleaning those data sets and actually getting really good signal out of them are getting a lot better. Uh, and so the, the sort of end result of that is I think there's a lot more data sets that are interesting, useful and predictive now uh, than there were even two or three years ago. Awesome. On the same lines, Josh, there's a, the next question asks, what types of data sets do you mostly work with? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty massive variety. Uh, you know, arguably like a huge core of underlying data is still going to be more classical stuff, right? Like you're gonna like, whether you agree with it or not, there's still a lot of people that are using um, technicals. You're gonna get a lot of stuff related to like balance sheet, you know, analyst data, et cetera. Like it, it's pretty rare you see a model that doesn't incorporate that at all. Um, but then, I mean, outside of that, the, the diversity is just like utterly massive. Um, you know, I think we see a lot of people that try to do stuff with like credit card data, market movie news, Twitter sentiment. Those are pretty common, I'd say. But then you get all kinds of like idiosyncratic data sets that you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't think about. Um, and I, I always like to bring up truck boards as an example, because it's not something I would have thought about. Right. Um, when truck boards, when trucks are sort of traveling across the country, they'll go on these different boards and if they have a lot of empty space. Uh, they'll advertise that and say, you know, I've got empty space. I'm trying to move from here to there. Um, or, you know, flip side, maybe you're a realtor and you've uh, used up your whole fleet and you want to move a good, you'll go on truck board and say, I want to move this particular good. Uh, and there can actually be a lot of interesting signal there. Um, if you're, uh, you know, if you have a lot of trucks that are partially empty, that's maybe not a good sign. On the flip side, uh, if there's a lot of goods that uh, are not getting moved, that might indicate some supply chain issues, maybe. Um, you know, I mean, there can be stuff related to like risk factors extracted out of like 10 Ks and, and 10 Qs. Um, you know, a lot of times there are certain factors of related to different companies that can be embedded in that. Um, there's stuff related to, um, uh, different types of, uh, like geolocation data. Um, you know, I, I mean, literally like I could name dozens and dozens of data sets. Obviously the classics are still the classics that are there for a reason. Um, but I think outside of like the, you know, core data, the variety is, is truly staggering. Awesome. Uh, the next question, uh, have you leveraged news and ESG sentiment data? 
Uh, yeah, so we don't have that integrated in our platform, but uh, there absolutely are a number of clients that, um, oh, sorry, we, we do have ESG data. Let me take that back. We do have ESG yes. data uh, integrated into our platform uh, on the back of uh, Allen Analytics and a few other providers. Um, and so, yeah, if you want to come in and build like an ESG flavored portfolio, or if you want to use ESG data as part of your prediction, that's something you can absolutely do. Um, we also have a number of clients that use news data as part of their, uh, as part of their model building. Uh, but that's not something that we have integrated natively. Uh, but if that's something you're interested in, that's absolutely something we can help you with. Awesome. I'm interested to know how AI is impacting asset management and particularly those firms that have an ESG focus. I think we just touched on that. Would you like to uh, yeah. go into more detail? Um, I, I feel like that, you know, I've, I've beaten most of those. <laughs> most of that to death. Right. I can probably keep going. Absolutely. Cool. Uh, I would appreciate any comments on emerging markets data, for example, Brazil. Um, and some, some study on the performance of short strategies uh, for assets with positive beta. Yeah, so, I mean, we, we support uh, emerging markets now as a firm. Um, and I think the other comment I'll make is there tends to be a lot of signal uh, in emerging markets. You know, we have found, even for a country like China, you know, in China, 95% uh, of trading is still done by retail traders. Um, I don't know the exact stats for Brazil, but I imagine it's, it's actually still a fairly high number. Um, and sort of the net result of that is we find there tends to be more inefficiencies or sort of different sorts of idiosyncratic uh, signal there. Um, the trick, of course, is like it can be tough to find borrow or the short interest can be really, really high. Um, and so, you know, you can find stocks that you want to short uh, fairly easily. I think the bigger challenge there is, is how do you find stocks that you want to short um that you can short uh in in a you know at scale um so again you know i don't know I, this would probably be something where you'd want to actually talk to someone on the cs team and talk a little bit more about the mandate and what you're trying to do it's certainly something the technology is capable of but the execution of that technology is, is not always trivial awesome next question how do you build the case for ai in asset management for companies that lack an understanding of ai yeah, I think, like I said, a lot of this really comes down to almost sort of like educational understanding. And, and, you know, what I was saying earlier about how I think a lot of people don't really know what the what the system can do and what the value is. Um, you know, that said, what I have noticed or what we have as firm has noticed, there seems to be just this really big switch. Um, you know, I, I would say kind of where we were at the beginning of last year maybe the year before is it tended to be people that were a little bit more technology forward, tended to be people that were, uh, you know, trying to get ahead of the game and be a little more innovative. Um, you know, what we found, especially in the past six months is there's a lot more uh, of these much bigger, more sort of standard shops um, and a lot more CIOs at some of these much bigger standard shops that are just starting to recognize this is kind of where the industry is going and this is what you need to do. Um, so, you know, a lot in the early day really came down to us sort of doing a lot of education um, and just trying to sort of help people understand where and how they can move. Uh, I'd say kind of where we are as a firm right now, I think that's largely happened. I think most of the industry has kind of recognized this is the direction you need to go. Um, and so I guess my sort of like general comment on that is like, if you're not a firm that's already excited about this or this kind of technology, probably it's at some point in your new future, you will be, um, or it'll, it'll start to come into town. Absolutely. Uh, cool. Next question. What audit tools are there to to monitor the AI decision-making process? Yeah, so I think for us, a really big part of that really comes down to explainability, interpretability, and really you know, doing it at every single level of the pipeline. Number one, you own the model. You, you, know, you own telling the model, here's what the prediction is. You own telling the model, here's where, you know, here's what you should learn from. You don't tell the model what to learn, but you tell the model, here's what you should learn from. Um, you tell the model, you know, here's my investment horizon, here's, you know, here's my mandates, right? This is the turnover that I'm allowed to have. This is what I need the carrying capacity of the strategy to be. This is what I think my market impact is going to be. Uh, you basically tell the machine, you know, sort of all the same piece of input that you would think about as a human. So that, you know, you end up with a model that's very, very tailor built for you. Um, and then the model itself does a very good job at explaining itself. Um, and actually telling you, this is exactly what's driving it. These are how the different sets of data interact with each other. This is the sort of idiosyncratic pattern that we found that's leading to this particular prediction. Um, and oftentimes it's done in a way where, you know, a human can really understand it and really sort of identify the decision being made. Um, and then, you know, really, really similar on the portfolio construction or risk analysis side. We're not just saying, you know, here's some sort of random 
um, risk factors, we're, we're finding these idiosyncratic non-standard risk factors, but we're actually able to name them and give a detailed explanation behind what's driving it and what risk it found and what the sort of underlying theme or connection between those risks are. Um, so for us, a lot of that comes down to not just making really good ML, um, but making really good ML in a way that it can communicate and sort of work with the human. By doing that, you're able to sort of monitor it. Now, of course, there's all kinds of other tools around like, you know, drawdown limitations or tracking error limitations or other kinds of things if you want to do it in a more automated way. But for us, we see a really critical part of sort of curating the AI is having the AI be able to work with and communicate with the human. Thank you. Next question. Uh, how can an asset manager trust a model's predictions? Yeah, I mean, I'll just <laughs> more or less just circle my answer to the last yeah. question, which is just yeah. like you want to have ownership over the building process from beginning to end. Um, and then, you know, if, if the AI can explain itself to you and, you, and, and the explanation makes sense, and you sort of understand what's driving it, we found that to be really, really critical. Uh, and, and we found on the flip side, if all you're doing is showing a signal uh, and not giving a deal explanation, you know, you, you can do very, very well with more quantitatively oriented firms that way. And there, you certainly, you know, have some quantitative firms that just use their system to build um, uncorrelated signal and, and that's all they get. But for the vast majority of fundamental firms, it's really, really important that the machine can actually explain itself and that you can understand that explanation and that the explanation is value added. Awesome. Uh, I think the next question is very similar also, but I'll still ask, how does one navigate the apprehension of end users towards the black box effect of AI? Well, yeah, again, I mean, I, I think there's actually several answers to that. Cause yeah, of course I can go back to explainable and interpretable AI. Um, but I think the other sort of related comment I'll make is having a battle tested system um, that's operationalized and used by some of the largest firms in the world is certainly helpful. Um, having you know a, a team you know generally speaking like the, the client support team we have in, in house is, is very strong there's a number of people on the uh, on the sell side who were you know former portfolio managers at different tiger cubs um there's you know obviously a very very detailed quant team so of course having a really strong team um able to back it up and a cs team that really understands what they're talking about is helpful uh and then of course you know once you've actually built a model and, and run it uh actually running with and and using the model for a certain period of time is super helpful uh, we find clients tend to sort of fit into three phases. You know, number one, you first start, you get really excited. You start building out a whole bunch of different models. Uh, number two, you start um, looking at some of the predictions and analyzing it. Um, and then number three, you start deploying money on it and using it as part of your you know, direct investing process. Um, and it can take as much as six months to get from that phase one to the sort of money running process. Uh, and that's okay. Um, you know, both because it takes you a little bit of time to sort of learn and sort of think about how to think about things way. And also because building trust, you know, just like anything else uh, is, is a gradual process. Um, but, you know, that's something that we've found that we've done. We've had a fairly good uh, uh, conversion ratio on in terms of getting people sort of over the initial hump and, and getting the process integrated. Thank you, Josh. Next question. How precise are Boosted.ai's predictions on, pardon me, predictions for financial instruments and how do you benchmark the performance of your solution? Um, yeah, so I think there's several potential um, questions that I think after this, by the way, Sarah, let's maybe shift to some of the questions sure. that are asked um, that were asked live. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, on the benchmarking side, uh, honestly, it 100% depends on what the strategy is trying to build is, right? If I'm trying to do a net neutral strategy, um, then maybe I care about um, just, you know, blank or, or maybe the risk free rate or something. Um, if I'm trying to do, you know, a technology strategy or an S&P 500 strategy, then I should use the appropriate benchmark, right? If I'm doing an S&P 500 strategy, I should probably use the S&P 500 or SPY or BOO or something like that. Um, I think in general, kind of an important thing to understand is the way that we're back testing ourselves um, is very much done in an out of sample way. So, you know, if we take like a, a back test going back to 2008 as an example, what we're doing is for the year 2008, we're taking data from 2000 to 2007. We're learning on that data, we're analyzing that data. Um, and then we make our predictions for 2008 sort of completely out of sample. And then three months later, we roll the window of data three months. Um, and we just are continuously doing that. So for a say 10 year back test, you're actually seeing the performance uh, of like 40 different models, right? These are models that were continuously trained sort of throughout it. 
you're also, you know, scanning for things like look ahead bias, survivorship bias. Uh, we're analyzing and making sure that we're controlling for p -val hacking. We're making sure that you're not like just running too many of the experiments uh, and getting statistically insignificant results. Um, and so the end result is that the the back test performs really, really closely to your live results, generally speaking. Uh, you know, the sort of thing I like to say is it can be frustratingly difficult to build a good back test in our system. But if you do build a good back test, your live results tend to be very, very good as well. Uh, the other comment, uh, you know, related to accuracy, I mean, you know, it really depends on the domain, the space, the investment horizon. Um, I would say like the best model I've ever seen is maybe, you know, 55, 56% accurate in predicting stocks going to beat the benchmark. Um, and, you know, similarly in terms of 55, 56% accurate in predicting stocks that are loose to the benchmark. Um, and, you know, if you hear someone tell you they can do better than that, um, I would be highly skeptical. <laughs> um, you know, generally speaking, though, you can get alpha and good predictive value, even if you're as low as like 52, 53%. Uh, accurate and finding stocks that beat the benchmark. Again, the sort of analogy I like to give is uh, it's like being a casino, right? You want to you want to you want to be the, the, the casino at a blackjack game. You want to play a number of hands, um, and you want to get the probability in your favor. And if you do that, um, things will work out in the long run, and you'll you'll end up beating whatever it is that you're trying to benchmark yourself against. And okay, that said, let's open up to uh, some of the live questions. Absolutely. How does the licensing to access the data sets work through your platform? Is it up to the client or is it managed by Boosted AI? Yeah, so uh, we have in the back end data partnerships with like S&P, Allo Analytics, uh, FactSet, um, you know, and, and like basically six other data providers. So there's like, you know, 6,000 different data feeds that are pre-built into the platform. And you get access to that right off the bat um, just with a sort of platform access feed. Um, and we do tend, tend to charge per seat um, or, or login, put it a different way. Um, and But yeah, about half of our clients are using data that's already pre-baked into the system. And we're constantly adding new data to it and finding new data sets to integrate in. Um, and then, you know, on the flip side, uh, it, there's also a really easy to use way to integrate your own data sets. There's a really quick and easy like point and click interface where you can drop in a CSV of data or if you want to do an API hookup or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, about half our clients are using only data that's already in the system and about half our clients are bringing their own data to bear as well. Thank you. Do you have a list of models available in your platform? Do you have both supervised and unsupervised models? So there's two ways to parse the verbiage of model there. Uh, based on your second question, I'm going to assume that you mean algorithm. Um, but, you know, if you did mean like, do we have pre-baked models? Um, not really. We're not, we're not, we're not in the business of selling pre-baked models. We're not like trying to sell you the best S and P 500 model or the best R one K model. What we are selling is a platform that makes it easy for you to develop out your own model. Now, if your question really was related to algorithms and do we have pre-baked algorithms? Uh, yeah. So you can come into our system and you can use a number of off the shelf algorithms. You know, if you want to do like an NN based on TensorFlow, or you want to do something from like XG boost, that's all stuff that's there, but and then, you know, the majority of clients are actually using some of our proprietary technology. So we've built a whole suite of finite specific um, algorithms that do a really good job at like modeling non-stationarity, look ahead bias, um, uh, 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 you know, stuff oriented around uh, the regime shifts or dealing with seasonality or dealing with all these other types of things that are really, really common in finance. Um, and you get a whole library of those that you can kind of pick from if you want to, or you can pick from some of the more like classical off the shelf things. Um, you know, and then I guess sort of related to your unsupervised question, um, you know, mostly even if you're doing a somewhat unsupervised approach here, everything is kind of supervised underneath the hood, right? Cause like ultimately you're trying to make a prediction about something. I'm trying to make a prediction about alpha. I'm trying to make a prediction about, um, you know, earnings. Maybe I'm trying to make, maybe on the portfolio side, I'm trying to make predictions about covariances or something like that. Uh, and so generally speaking, you know, even if you're doing some unsupervised esque approach, there is really at some level, some part of your objective function is, is probably getting some type of supervision. Um, but yeah, the, you know, if, if your sort of underlying question is, is there a library of algorithms that I can choose from? The answer is yes. Wonderful. 
the next question, uh, it asks, could you clarify which ETFs are using your platform? Would you like to answer uh, that? No. <laughs> Look, uh, uh, we, you know, you. we've got we've got a number of clients. Um, and, and like I said, our, I think our biggest client is, you know, it's over a trillion in assets. Um, I'm, uh, I'm allowed to talk about some partnerships. So, you know, I think we're, I think we're public about our partnership with uh, China AMC. I think we're also public about our partnership with RBC. Um, you know, there's also a few very large US banks and institutions that we're working with. Um, but no, I, I very specifically cannot tell you what ETFs uh, are using this platform. That's helpful enough, thank you. Uh, how does Boosty.ai's machine learning platform readily integrate in new data sets, which may be foreign to the existing model? Yeah, so, I mean, there's sort of a few ways to unpack that, right? So there's the first part of like getting the data, make sure you're doing a good job of the, uh, you know, the security master and security mapping, um, and then doing some initial cleaning on the data, you know, again, looking for all those problems I talked about related to look ahead, spot ship, blah, 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 um, you know, and then sort of normalizing the data, right? So you're going to get some data sets that are like, might follow more of a bimodal distribution, or they might follow a power distribution, or they might have seasonality, you know, not stationarily, all that kind of jazz. And then there's an element of like taking that data, transforming it into a usable spot. And then finally, once you've got the data, and this is all, by the way, done completely under the hood, you don't have to really think about it as a user. You can, if you want, you can get into that details, but for the majority of users, you're not really thinking about it. Then once you've kind of got this data up to the point where it's in a good spot, um, then you can just basically take uh, the existing data, that data, um, and build a new model. And, and actually we found two different approaches, both work fine. Uh, number one, you can literally just take an old data set and a new data set and then just train a completely new model off of it. Or if you have two data sets and you think that they're very uncorrelated, um, you can actually build one model using the historical data, build a new model using a new set of data, uh, and then just create an ensemble of both of them. Um, and quite oftentimes you'll find it's something that is uh, value add if, if they are in fact uncorrelated and gives you, uh, you know, at the same or higher signal at a lower skew over time. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's several ways to do that, but it's all pretty point and click and easy to do in the platform. Thank you. Uh, I think this question stems from the slide you showed on the Battle Royale noise reduction model. Uh, it asks to give some color um, on the model, uh, specifically the underlying model type, and if you take target rebalancing frequency into the train test split. Yes. Um, so I think a few things to note on the train test split. Um, if your out of sample is from the same time period uh, that you trained on, even if it's data sets that it's never seen before, uh, you're, you're cheating and you're building a, a somewhat sort of cheating model. Um, and so for us, it's really, really important. You know, you can do train validation and test really. It's really important that we're always testing on a go forward basis. So, you know, for 2008, I am only learning on data from prior to 2008. And then I'm analyzing my performance for the U2008, and it's got to be data that it's never seen before, right? So for the month of January, I'm making a prediction, and it can never have seen any data from the month of January. Um, do we take rebound? Yes, we do. Um, although the training, the retraining frequency can actually be independent uh, from the rebalancing frequency. Um, you may want to retrain, you know, once a year and rebalance every day, or you know, on the flip side, you might want to um, retrain once a week. Uh, and trade once a week. Um, it almost it would never make sense to like trade once a year and rebalance every week. So you know from that perspective it matters. But um, yeah, you can you can absolutely configure those things if you want. Uh, and again, for a lot of users, that decision can be hidden. You don't have to really think about it. But if you want to get to the nitty gritty and sort of adjust uh, some of those things, yeah. Um, as for the underlying model type, um, I will just say that really it is possible to get value out of a huge variety of different types of models. Um, but the vast majority of them just don't work super well. So, you know, like in particular, if you want to build like an NN model, um, you have to be very careful how you think about and incorporate noise. Um, you know, with like the sort of like classical error being like, if you just take an LSTM out of the box and throw it at this, it's more or less just going to predict beta. Um, you know, in general, stocks kind of go up over time. So you have to deal with like the class imbalance problem. You have to deal with the noise problem. Um, you have to deal with like a whole bunch of different things. Uh, and so, you know, on our side, we've basically got different flavors of things. You've got some things that are going to be more like tree-based or NN-based. Um, 
or regression based or whatever. But really for all of these things, we've kind of rebuilt them from the ground up. We tend to have fairly unique objective functions and believe it or not, we actually have in some cases, unique solvers. We had to go all the way down to the solver level in order to find something that was predictive. So yeah, to, to answer the question, there's a, a wide variety uh, of different model types that are feeding into this. We're tending to use different ensembles um, and we're doing it in a way that uh, intelligently models the very specific types of uh, problems in the space. Great, thank you. I think in the last 40 seconds, I'll squeeze in one more uh, small question. Um, if we look out five to 10 years, where do you see this technology and what are you most excited about? Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, a big thesis behind this company um, is that this is kind of where the industry is going. Uh, 10 years from now, I expect that every portfolio manager will need hopefully our tool, but uh, if not our tool, a tool like this. I think that everyone's going to need to use some kind of machine learning in the process in order to sort of stay competitive. Uh, I sort of see this very similar to the adoption curve of like Bloomberg Terminal, right? The earliest users of the Bloomberg Terminal um, had a huge alpha advantage over everyone else. You got unprecedented visibility into the bond market. Today, you don't buy a Bloomberg Terminal because, you, because it gives you alpha. You buy a Bloomberg Terminal because you kind of need it to even be competitive. Um, I sort of see that as the, hist as the future of machine learning. The early adopters, the people using it right now, have a huge advantage using machine learning in their process. But I think 10, 15 years from now, uh, more or less, I think that's kind of what everyone's going to need to do to, to even you know, be considered in this space. Um, so I don't, I'm obviously <laughs> the, the head of a, a company providing a platform like that, but I find it really, really exciting. And I'm very comfortable where the industry is going.